Welcome back. Our next guest is a best-selling author, acclaimed artist, speaker, social ju justice activist, and founder of The, the Body, Body is Not an Apology Movement, an online community created to foster self-love and encourage positivity. So here to celebrate her incredible body of work, we are thrilled to speak with her today, Sonia Renee Taylor, coming to us from a beautiful New Zealand today. <laughs> Good morning. Hello, everyone. Sonia, I've been a huge fan and follower of yours for a long time, so I'm really excited to have you here. I want to start with the title of your book, The Body is Not an Apology. It is such a powerful statement. Where did this phrase originally come from? Um, so the phrase originated as part of a conversation with a friend um, many years ago, almost over a decade now. I was having a conversation with a girlfriend who was afraid that she might have an unintended pregnancy. And I asked her about, I'm notorious for getting in my friend's business from a place of love. Uh, and so I asked her um, about her sexual health practices and choices. I also used to be a sexuality health educator. And my friend had a disability, and she said that her disability made it difficult for her to be sexual already, so she didn't feel entitled to ask this person to use protection. And my response immediately was just, your body is not an apology. It's not something you offer to someone to say sorry for my disability. And after that, it just kind of stuck with me. I was clear I'd said something I needed to hear, too. Wow, that's a powerful story. Um, you know, at the beginning of your book, you actually start to call out those um, who are looking for answers to self-esteem or self-confidence issues. And you say this book will not teach you how to fix those things, but it will instead um, pull you toward radical self-love. So define that for us. Absolutely. So radical self-love is our inherent sense of worthiness and enoughness. It is the way in which we arrived on the planet. I tell people all the time, you've never seen a self-loathing toddler. You've never seen a toddler who's like, I just hate my thighs. I can't deal. Right. Like <laughs> babies come here <laughs> fully in love with themselves. They, they come here in wonder of their own bodies and in wonder of the bodies of others. And the truth is, we all arrived here with that sense of ownership over our beings. And over um, our lifetimes, we lose that. Uh, we get further and further away from it. But it's always there. And self-confidence and self-esteem, those things can be fleeting. You know, they depend on the weather or whether or not someone gave you the compliment on the outfit. But radical self-love always is. It's inherent. It's how we arrived on the planet. I love what you're saying so much, but uh, it doesn't take long before media and society start giving different messages and telling us that a specific yeah. type of body is desirable or only beautiful. Um, so how do we move away from that kind of body shame? Can you actually break down the four pillars of radical self-love? So, yeah, I talk about I, I try to add frameworks to the work because it's the way my brain works. And so the four pillars are these sort of ideas that we can settle into that might help us understand how we access our radical self-love more readily. And so um, they include um, unapologetic, uh, they include courageous conversations, that taking out the toxic, mind matters, unapologetic action, and collective compassion. And taking out the toxic is about noticing the messages around us that tell us that we're not enough, that tell us that there's something wrong with us or the bodies that we're in. Um, mind Matters is about then, once we've noticed and brought that to awareness, what can we shift in our own thinking about that indoctrination? How do I change my own thoughts so that I'm not just taking on those messages from the media? And then unapologetic action is about shifting our behaviors. Now that we've, we have thought new ways and we are in a position to start doing new things differently than the way we used to. And then the last is collective compassion. And that's about recognizing that this is not about getting it right. It's not about arriving at some destination. It's about being in practice on a daily basis and being really loving and kind and compassionate with ourselves as we take this very long lifetime journey.
Mm. I think for some who are listening, um, they will recognize this idea that bodies and apologies are kind of intertwined, and it might be because of the way that they see their their weight, or maybe they have a disability, or maybe it's because of, of their uh, their race. Um, how do we learn to stop apologizing for just existing and become comfortable with taking the space we need? So I think that the first step is absolutely about recognizing where you're apologizing. Where has that become a default? Is that taking up a small space? I had a conversation one time um, with a woman who had multiple sclerosis for part of a, a coalition of folks, of people of color with multiple sclerosis. And she shared that oftentimes she wouldn't use her um, mobility aid because she had shame about taking up too much space in public with her mobility aid. And I just thought it was such an interesting uh, experience to have someone lessen their ability to get around because they were afraid of how other people might perceive what they needed to do to do that. And so that was a way in which she was apologizing on a daily basis. And it wasn't until she was in a conversation about this idea of no longer apologizing that she recognized that as one of those, one of those small ways that she was apologizing. So I think it's about learning and identifying the small places in our life where we are engaged in that act of apology and then just in one single moment saying, what if I didn't do that this time? If this time I decided mm -hmm. to do the thing that's most authentic. And the more we build that muscle, the stronger it gets, the more unapologetic we become. Mm, I love that. Yeah, I also love that you talk so much in your work about white supremacy and intersectionality, uh, especially when it comes to desired body types. So why do you think it is so important that we look at beauty standards through those specific lenses? Because we live in societies that were born of and built on uh, what we call a default body inside of the book. And it's a certain kind of body that we've said is the right body. And under the system of colonization, under the systems of white supremacist uh, exploitation inside of our societies, we've decided that that body is the white body. We've also decided that body is the thin body. We've decided that body is the young body, is the abled body, right? And so if we're not paying attention to whose body we say is normal, then we will always uh, unconsciously other every other kind of body. And that means that those other bodies get less resource, they get less opportunity, they get less care. And so if we really want societies that are equal and just, we have to start dismantling the idea of the default body. You recently posted a YouTube video where you asked people to rethink their internalized fat phobia. Uh, what, you know, this, this was, I think, a New Year's uh, uh, video. What, what did you want us to call upon us to do and why right now? Yeah, so, you know, I did a conversation a few years ago and I titled it like New Year, Same Me. <laughs> what if I decided that the me that I am going into this year is just as valid, just as important, just as desirable, just as worthy of love as any other version of me that I could create? What, what would happen then? What might that free up? Because I think so often and very specifically towards uh, women and femme presenting people, we tell them that they need to be on some constant mission to alter who it is they are. And th underneath that message is because who you have been isn't sufficient. And I think that when we shake off the shackles of not enoughness, then actually what we do is we move from our joy, from our inherent passion and power. And then the changes that want to manifest from that place get to get activated. So I'd much rather us embrace who we are today and then see what wants to jump from that than assuming there's something wrong from us and calling ourselves changing from that place. So you say that starting a radical self-love journey can feel like a pretty overwhelming task. So what advice would you give to someone who does want to start exploring this? So, you know, how, how do we even start to build a world that is great for every body? Yeah, so I think that it is first important for us to locate ourselves in the conversation. We often try to start messing with structural things first. And what I deeply believe is that the structures are made of us. They're made of our individual beliefs, behaviors, and activities out in the world. And so when I begin to look and say, where have I um, been indoctrinated into the idea that I'm not enough? 
In what ways is this idea that I should be apologizing living inside of my everyday life? Can I start noticing it? Can I ask my friends to point out when I'm being self-deprecating? Can I uh, n ask my kids to say, hey, mom, you're doing that thing again? And can I start raising that to consciousness first? And once I have some practice in raising that to consciousness, then I have some space to start taking new actions. And the more that we repeat raising it to consciousness and taking new actions over and over again, that's how we create a new way of being. And I think ultimately, once we have collectively created a new way of being, we will have a different way that the world operates. What an important conversation. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad that technology allows us to connect in this way, truly. Uh, we want to tell everybody watching, you can learn more by check out, checking out The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. Thank you again, and we'll be back right after this.